Hey everybody, welcome back to our webinars here at Pasadena Humane. My name is Isabel and I work in the outreach department here. Um, we actually had a huge amount of people wanting to go ahead and learn more about rabies and what it really means in our community. So with us today is the ad amazing Dr. Melissa J. Hi, Dr. J. Hi, Isabel. Hey, so I understand you have a background in this. Do you mind sharing what your title and what you do? Sure. My name is Dr. Melissa J. I am a public health veterinarian for Los Angeles County's Department of Public Health. That is amazing. And she's with us today to go ahead and share her expertise. But before we get started, we actually do have a couple of reminders. So let's go ahead and get into that. Alrighty, guys. So, do 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 do. Webinar reminders. Please keep in mind that all attendees are automatically muted. So, while you can see and hear us, we cannot see or hear you. We respectfully ask that you guys please save your questions for the end. We will be doing a short Q and A at the end, so that will be your chance to ask all of your burning rabies questions. If you do have those questions, we ask that you use the chat feature at the bottom of your GoToWebinar um, control panel. This will only be seen by the organizer, and as time permits, we'll go ahead and have Dr. J answer them. Do not worry if for any reason you guys have to get up and leave in the middle of this presentation. It will be recorded and sent to your emails that you used at registration. So anything you miss, you will be able to catch up on. And we'd like everyone to keep in mind, we do have a whole bunch more free content upcoming in October. We are gonna have Pet Massage with Amber Lockspear. She is a certified animal massage therapist. That's gonna be a lot of fun, so please make sure to tune in. And without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and have you take it away, Dr. J. Thank you, Isabel. I believe I'm sharing my screen currently, and I think it's okay. So I'm going to get started. So hello and good afternoon. My name is Dr. Melissa J. I am a veterinarian for the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about rabies in Los Angeles County and how to protect yourself, your family, and your pet. So just a little introduction to us and our program. We are the local public health authority for Los Angeles County. Veterinary public health is a smaller program within the larger department of public health. And we have two mandated duties. The first is rabies control. And the second is animal disease investigations. So in addition to these mandates, we also perform other duties such as animal import inspections at LAX airport and various other educational outreach projects that relate to both animal health and human health. We serve Los Angeles County, which spans about 4,000 square miles with a population of approximately 10 million people, about 28% of California's total population. Our jurisdiction covers all of the county except for the cities of Pasadena, Long Beach, and Vernon, which have their own health departments. So just an outline of what we're going to talk about today, we're going to discuss three main topics about rabies. First, we'll start off with some background information about rabies. What is it? How do you get it? And why bats are an important animal to consider? Then we'll discuss the risk of contracting rabies here in Los Angeles County. And then we will discuss the most important part, which is how to protect yourself and your pets, including what to do if your pet is bitten by wildlife, what to do if you are bitten by an animal, 
and what to do if you find a bat. There are also resources at the end that I will share um, where you can go to find out more information beyond what I present today and contact information for how to reach us at the Department of Public Health. So I think we're going to start off with a poll question now, um, just to kind of see where everyone's knowledge is at. And it's going to be, how is rabies commonly transmitted from an animal to a human? The poll will be closing in about four seconds. Okay, Dr. J, our answers, 97% uh, of the audience says by bite or saliva transfer. That's great. So that is the correct answer. And so let's just dive in and get started talking about rabies. Um, so rabies is a disease caused by a virus. So it is not a bacterial infection, so it cannot be treated by antibiotics or commonly used medications. Other notable viral diseases that you may have heard of or know before are influenza or the flu virus, parvovirus that we see in dogs, and of course COVID-19 is the disease caused by a coronavirus. So different viruses target different parts of the body. The rabies virus in particular travels through nerves and its ultimate target organ is the brain. So anytime the rabies virus is in an animal or a human's body, it will travel throughout the nerves within the body with the end goal of always reaching the brain. Once it is in the brain, it is also in the saliva and that is why animals or humans that are sick with rabies are also infectious via their bite or their saliva. Interestingly, the rabies virus is not stable and cannot survive well outside of the body. So unlike the current coronavirus or even say the flu virus, where those can live on surfaces or be transmitted through the air in droplets, the rabies virus cannot live on a surface well or be infectious through the air. So who can get rabies? Rabies is a disease of mammals. So common mammals that we know of and live with here in the county include dogs, cats, raccoons, skunks, foxes, coyotes, and many more. Any mammal can get rabies um, and actually including opossums. Opossums are technically marsupials. They're not exactly mammals, but there is a popular myth out there that opossums are resistant to rabies. Um, but rabbit opossums, so opossums with rabies, have been found within LA County and also within the state of California. So if only mammals can get rabies, that means animals such as birds, reptiles, insects, and fish do not have rabies. And this means that the only flying mammal with rabies is bats. Another interesting fact about rabies is that there are different strains of the virus for different species. So there is dog rabies, skunk rabies, raccoon rabies, on and on. Uh, when scientists look at rabies in patients, you can actually determine what type of rabies is in the body. For example, a human who is diagnosed with rabies can have that rabies typed out by animal strain and even sometimes by region, such as this human is infected with dog rabies from Thailand or this human is infected with bat rabies from India. Moving on to how is rabies spread? So we answered this in the poll question already. The most common mode of spread is through animal bites or saliva transfer. An animal with rabies, so sometimes we just call it a rabid animal, has to bite you and break the skin to get that infectious saliva and rabies virus into your body, or somehow directly transfer that infectious saliva into your eyes, nose, mouth, or into an open wound. A question that we hear a lot is, what is considered a bite? 
A bite is when an animal's tooth breaks your skin. So that could be in the form of a scratch by the tooth or an actual puncture with the bite. There is also a difference between a scratch from a paw and a scratch from a tooth when you're talking about rabies exposure. Remember that we said the rabies virus does not survive outside of the body well. So if a cat has rabies and scratches me with her paw, that is not how I will get rabies from her. The cat with rabies has to bite me to give me rabies. Or I have to get that rabid cat saliva directly into my nose, eyes, mouth, or into an open wound. Another popular question out there is whether rabies can be inhaled. So let's give the same situation. Even if I had a rabid cat or a cat with rabies sitting next to me right now, and I'm petting her and breathing right next to her, that is not how I will contract rabies from her. There has not been human to human transmission of rabies, except in the case of organ donors. Um, unfortunately, in those cases, someone died and either rabies exposure was not known or diagnosed at the time of their death. So their organs that were transferred to other patients resulted in those recipients developing rabies and dying. Very sad cases indeed. So then that takes us to the, to the topic of bat exposures. So animal bites are quite noticeable and definite. If you are bitten by a cat or a dog, you know when you've been bit. However, bites from bats are not always obvious. Bats can be very small animals with very tiny teeth. A bat bite could be so small, um, potentially even heal up within 20 minutes without leaving a mark. Consider that if you are a very deep sleeper or incapacitated, perhaps you've had a few drinks before bed, you may not be woken by a bat biting you in your sleep. So we consider the highest risk exposure to bats and rabies to be when you wake up to find a bat either in your bedroom or in your home and you did not see it enter. To illustrate this just a little bit further, Imagine that we weren't on this call right now, but instead we were all in the same room together. Then imagine that we all fell asleep and then woke up an hour later to find a bat inside the same room as all of us. How would any of us know for sure that we were or were not bitten by that bat? The answer is that we wouldn't know. So the bottom line is that any interaction with a bat could be considered a possible exposure to rabies. And that is where a consult with our program or your local health department is always warranted. If you wake up to find a bat in your home or in your bedroom and you did not see that bat enter, you could have been bitten by that bat while sleeping and you could have gotten rabies from that bat. Here are some actual examples of bats that are found or common throughout the United States. They can be very tiny creatures fitting into areas as small as a quarter, the smallest of them weighing little more than a penny. And yet they still have about 30 to 38 teeth inside those tiny little mouths. Here is an actual bat bite on someone's finger. If you cannot see the bite well, it simply illustrates my point further. But these small bite wounds could heal up quickly and never leave a mark. Going back to our scenario of waking up in a room with a bat, it is incorrect if a physician or doctor tells you that because you do not have a bite wound from a bat that you are not exposed to rabies. This is a bat actually just found a couple of weeks ago at the beginning of September um, in Santa Clarita. This bat was found dead outside of a home and it shows just how tiny these animals can be. Please note too, the person in this photo is doing exactly what we advise against, never touch a bat with bare hands. 
And now I believe we're moving on to our second poll question, which is what animal is the number one source of rabies in California? Okay, the poll will be closing. Dr. J, this is a mixed bag of answers between raccoons and bats. Ah, oh, interesting. So I will say if you live on the East Coast, um, bats, def or sorry, raccoons definitely come more to mind as animals that are likely to carry rabies. Um, but luckily here on the West Coast and here in California specifically, and right down to where we are in the county, um, it is bats. Bats here in Los Angeles County and for the state of California are the number one um, source of rabies. So now that we have covered what rabies is and how you get rabies, now let's talk a little bit about the signs of rabies. So rabies can start off looking like any other disease with nonspecific symptoms. But what distinguishes it from many other types of diseases is that it usually progresses very quickly to neurologic signs. Neurologic signs are what happen when your brain is affected by the virus. In animals such as a dog, this might be seen as unsteady walking or kind of walking like they're drunk or wobbly, maybe biting at inanimate objects like a fence or maybe the ground, um, and unprovoked aggression. A bat with rabies might show abnormal behavior such as flying during the daytime, not flying away from people and pets, or being found on the ground due to the inability to fly. One more very interesting and crucial point to mention when talking about rabies is how long it can take between when you are bitten to when you start to show symptoms. There's actually a lot of misinformation out there on the internet about this fact. I've had several people read that if you are bitten by a bat and you don't start treatment that day, that you could die. Similarly, others have told me they read that if you are bitten by a bat, but survive the next 72 hours without symptoms, then you didn't contract rabies and you will be fine. So let's dispel both of those myths right now. If you are bitten by an animal with rabies, it will take anywhere from weeks to years before you start to show symptoms. Once you do show symptoms, then it rapidly progresses as we, as we just went over, but it could take weeks to years for the virus to sit in your body before it arrives to its target area, which we said is the brain. Once you start to show symptoms of rabies, unfortunately there is no cure and it is too late to seek treatment. People and animals with signs of rabies will not get better and it will be fatal. It would be incorrect for a doctor to tell you that you should only call him or her if you start to show symptoms of rabies after a bite. You will not die the next day after getting bit by a rabid animal, but you do need to start treatment before you start to show symptoms. So long as you are treated properly for rabies before you start to show symptoms, it can be prevented 100%. So now that we know more about rabies and why it is so important, let's look at our risk of contracting rabies here in Los Angeles County. Just like how we answered in the poll, here in Los Angeles County and for the state of California, bats are the number one source of rabies. So bat exposures to either pets or people are what we should be most concerned about. And if bats are the animals that we should be the most concerned about, it brings about the question of where in Los Angeles County are these rabid bats or rabies positive bats found? 
Is it just rural areas or maybe country areas that aren't very populated? And the answer is bats with rabies are found all over the county, even in urban and suburban areas. So looking at this map, which spans over 2009 to 2018, each one of those red dots represents where a resident reported a sick bat and when that sick bat tested positive for rabies. So I think we have another poll question coming up. And that question is, what is the best way to keep your pets protected from rabies? All right, the poll will be closing in five seconds. So Dr. J, there was only one answer to that question and it is keep them up to date with their rabies vaccinations. Great, I'm glad that there's only one answer and that is the correct answer. You guys are doing great. So, after we know that bats are the most important source of rabies here in our county, in our, in our communities, the next important question to ask is where around people and homes and pets are these bats with rabies found? If we look at the table on the left, the majority of rabid bats are found just outside of people's houses. So we receive a lot of reports that show that the bat was found either alive or dead on the driveway, in the front yard, in the backyard, on the porch, or clinging to a screen door. Every year, rabid bats are also found inside houses. So that's highlighted um, in yellow, that line. And remember we said that the highest risk rabies exposure since a bat could bite you um, is when a bat could bite you when you're sleeping and you may not know. If you look at the map on the right from 2019, uh, we recorded 50 rabid bats last year, um, all throughout the county. And about 30 to 40% of them were found in the Santa Clarita area. So if you live in this area or if you have family in this area, it is very important for you and your family um, and your neighbors to know about bats and rabies and how to protect yourselves. So then that brings us nicely to how do you protect yourself um, and your pets from rabies? Just like in the poll question, for your pets and your dogs, uh, sorry, for your pets, your dogs and your cats are most at risk for contracting rabies from wildlife, including bats that may bite them and then pass on the virus. So consider these potential scenarios that are happening all the time throughout the county. Um, your pet is at risk for getting rabies when he or she attacks or is attacked by um, a mammal, such as a coyote or a skunk, an opossum or a raccoon. Or your pet is at risk for getting rabies if he or she interacts with a bat. If a bat is sick with rabies, it is usually on the ground or unable to fly, and it's only natural for your pets to be interested in sniffing at that animal on the ground. Cats especially, usually. Um, cats are intrigued by anything that flies. And I know plenty of cats that would be happy to catch a bat and then bring it inside to their owners as a gift. We have had several reports of cats bringing in live bats from outside, through the cat door, into the home, even bringing it right into someone's bed. So in the summer, if you leave your doors and windows open, Potentially bats could fly into your home and then expose your indoor only cats and dogs. You may think by staying 100% indoors that your pet couldn't possibly be exposed to rabies, but every year, as we saw on the previous slide, we have about one to two rabies positive bats flying into people's homes and exposing both the humans and the pets inside. So 
So the bottom line here is that to protect your pets, you must vaccinate them for rabies and keep them up to date with regular boosters. Other ways to protect your pets and family would include leaving wildlife and stray animals alone and not encouraging them to come around or harboring them at your home. As we encroach on their territory more and more, it is inevitable that we will always have wildlife around us, sometimes passing through our backyards or searching for food. Wildlife is definitely to be respected, but do not encourage them to think that your house is a great place to hang out or find food. So don't leave pet food outside all day or overnight. Keep your foliage and bushes trimmed so that animals like opossums don't think that your house is a great place to burrow or sleep or nest. And if you see wildlife that is either injured, acting sick, or even dead, please report these to your local animal control. They can work with us to pick up rabies suspect wildlife. We can test those animals to find out if they indeed had rabies and then follow up with you to determine if anyone or any pets were exposed. Another way to protect yourself from rabies, if you have a job that puts you more at risk or if you are traveling to areas with higher rabies risk, you may consider getting pre-exposure rabies vaccines through your doctor or at a travel clinic. So what should you do if your pet is bitten by wildlife or is exposed to a bat? The first step is to take your pet to your veterinarian and get them a rabies booster vaccination, even if they are already up to date. Your vet is then required to report the incident to public health, and then likely you will receive instructions from public health about quarantining your pet at home so that you can properly monitor for symptoms of rabies. During a rabies quarantine, you will want to avoid getting bitten by your pet, even if it's just during play, and you want to avoid saliva transfers. So that is not the time to be really kissing your pet. I should also mention that anyone with knowledge of the bite or incident can report it to public health, meaning that your veterinarian can report it, or you can also report it yourself. If you get bitten by an animal, no matter what type of animal, the first step is always the same. Wash the wound out immediately with soap and water. And for a generous amount of time, so not just a quick wash, but ideally for maybe about five minutes, you would want to really wash out that wound. Studies have shown that significant amounts of bacteria and viruses can be inactivated by just washing out a wound. Then you will want to consult with a doctor or medical professional about the bite and have it reported. For a rabies risk consultation, either your doctor or you can call your local health department. If rabies treatment is indicated for you, rabies post-exposure prophylaxis, or sometimes abbreviated PEP, will be recommended. Remember that treatment is only effective if it is started before you have symptoms of rabies. The treatment itself consists of injections of antibodies that are given to combat the virus, along with four to five rabies vaccines that are spaced out over two weeks. It is no longer many injections given into the belly or given into the abdomen as it once was. It is important to mention that rabies PEP is not cheap. It could cost anywhere from $1,200 to $4,000 per person. Um, and we have actually even seen individuals with medical insurance receive bills for upwards of $20,000 for the entire treatment. So it is not to be taken lightly. And that brings us to our next poll question. If you find a bat in your house, and you do not know when it entered, you should immediately release it if it is alive or throw it into the trash if it is dead. Is that true or false? Okay, the poll will be closing. 
Dr. J, most of the audience says this is a false statement. Great. <laughs> you guys are doing really well. So you should not release it if you find it alive and you should not throw it into the trash if it is dead. So let's talk about that. What should you do if you find a bat? These pictures are all scenarios of maybe how you would encounter a bat here in the county. Perhaps you will find one that is already dead on the ground, or maybe it's still alive, but unmoving on the ground like the picture on the left. Or maybe you will find one like the middle picture where it is clinging to and not moving on a wall of a house or on a screen door. And this bat on the far right is actually just from a month ago um, from a resident of the county in mid city Los Angeles area um, where it flew into a apartment building bedroom at nighttime um, because the door, the balcony door was left open because it was so hot. Um, it was unfortunately this bat was attacked by the indoor only cat, but was still alive on the floor of the bedroom when the owner woke up. So in any of these situations, the most important thing is to not touch the bat with bare hands. You would want to put on thick gloves, such as gardening gloves, and then if possible to safely approach the bat, cover it with a box or a bucket to contain it. If the bat is inside of your house and you did not see it enter, do not release the bat to the outside. Instead, contain it in the room by closing off the doors and windows, and then also consider putting a container over it if possible. Then call your local animal control and ask them to come out to retrieve the bat so that it may be tested for rabies. You can then call public health or your local health department to discuss your rabies risk for this encounter. If you're calling us um, or if we cover your area, um, we will pick up the bat from animal control and have it tested at the public health laboratory for rabies. Then we will follow up with you, even if it's a negative result, uh, we'll follow up with you either way, um, negative or positive for rabies, and we'll go over with you the next steps for anybody or any pets that were exposed. So why should bats be reported to public health or animal control? And it's because reporting can literally save lives. Public health can only assist and provide life-saving information about a rabies exposure if we know about the exposure in the first place. In this very sad Florida case, a live bat was found outside of a house the father put the bat into a bucket and called animal control to retrieve it. The bat was tested by public health and found to be rabid. So even though this case was properly reported and tested, um, this is a, an example of the importance of teaching children not to touch bats. The child in the household initially denied touching the bat and only later admitted that he touched it and that the bat had scratched his finger with its teeth. But because he was very fearful of receiving rabies vaccinations and treatments, his parents did not take him to the doctor and unfortunately he became symptomatic and rabies claimed his life. I myself have a four-year-old and a two and a half year old at home. I'm teaching them what bats look like to never touch a bat and to fetch an adult if they ever see one. Thinking about children, this is also why rabid bats that are found at schools or public places always warrant our special attention because children are sometimes scared to admit that they have done something and understandably, they're not able to grasp the gravity of the situation. So it is up to us as adults to educate our families and especially children about the risk of rabies how to avoid animal bites, even from our own pets, and how to safely interact with and respect animals.
So even though I have been talking a lot about bats as an important source of rabies, I do also want to share with you the many positives and the importance of these animals in our ecosystem. Bats are protected wildlife and they should not be feared, but rather admired as they do provide excellent insect control and plant pollination in the environment. Some bats in California are capable of eating up to 600 mosquitoes in one hour. Also, only 1% of bats in nature truly have rabies. So it is important to realize that not all bats need to be recorded and collected for rabies testing. Bats that are outside flying, not exposing pets or humans should be left alone. The only bats that need to be reported are the ones that are behaving abnormally or that have been found inside of a house. So what is an abnormally acting bat? It is one that is out and exposed during the daytime because remember that these animals are nocturnal, meaning they, that they are active during the evening and nighttime. An abnormally acting bat is also one that is on the ground or unable to fly, or one that is not moving away from people or pets. Truly, they don't wish to be around us and they wish to be left alone. They're probably mostly scared of us. So a healthy, normal bat is always intending to get away from us. Ones that are found dead on a property or inside of a house are always ones that should be submitted and tested. And of course, any bat that a human or a pet touched should also be reported and tested. A question that we get asked a lot is what to do if you think bats are roosting in your attic or at your house? If you think that bats are roosting at your house, we recommend that you call a professional bat control company. It is illegal for members of the public to harass, harm, kill, or keep a bat because they are protected wildlife. So they are not pests that regular pest control will come out and destroy for you. But a professional bat control company can help to evaluate where the bats could be roosting or entering and they will help you to exclude an area so that bats can exit but not re-enter. They could also potentially check roosts for babies that are unable to fly and ensure that an area is excluded after the roost is empty. This is our website um, listed there at the bottom. Uh, we keep it updated with all of our rabbit bat data and maps, along with information about how to protect yourself, the history of rabies in LA County, and what to do if you ever find a bat in your home. I encourage you to check this website regularly just to keep up to date about where rabbit bats are being found and if they're being found in your neighborhood. Specifically, if you click on the link that says learn more about rabid bats found in 2020, we keep updating this page with every new rabid bat that we find. We post what city it was found in and the circumstances such as found alive by the front door or maybe found dead in the swimming pool. Um, and then with the table on the right, you can see that we are normally averaging about 30 to 40 rabid bats per year that are reported to and tested by us. As of today, uh, we are sitting at 42 rabbit bats for the year that we have found all throughout the county, um, as seen on that map right in the center. Every red dot that you see is where a rabbit bat has been found so far this year. Still, you can see that about 40, um, maybe even 50% of them this year have been found in the Santa Clarita area, where you kind of see that cluster of red dots towards the left part of the map. Uh, we're sitting at 42 bats for the year, but that number is still increasing because we are not yet out of bat season, which usually lasts until about October. 2019 and 2012 were record years um, when we found the highest numbers of rabid bats all throughout the county. This handout, also available on our website at the link at the very bottom of the slide, 
is a great document to refer to when you need to remind yourself about the rabies risk from the different animals here in Los Angeles County. You'll notice that there are some animals listed where if you are bitten by these animals, it is not reportable and not considered to be a rabies risk. So this includes rodents, squirrels, rabbits, birds, and snakes. Our contact information is also located at the bottom of the form. So it is a nice one to keep handy if you ever have questions about your rabies risk or if you need to report a bite. So in summary, I just want to remind you of the most important take home messages from this presentation. The first is to report animal bites to both pets and humans to public health. Remember that people exposed to rabies must be treated immediately. Rabies is fatal, but is 100% preventable if treated before symptoms arise. You can reach Los Angeles County Department of Public Health for rabies consultations at that number listed. The second take home message is to report abnormally acting bats or bat exposures to both pets and humans to public health. Remember that bats are the number one source of rabies in California and that bats inside the house may pose an especially high risk. Also remember to never touch a bat with bare hands and to teach that to anybody that you possibly can. Lastly, the best way to protect your pets from rabies is to keep them up to date with their rabies vaccinations. Here is our contact information one more time and I welcome any questions that you might have. Um, Dr. J, so someone from the community has asked if a rabid animal licks you and then you rub your eye or your nose, can rabies be transferred? So that's a great question. It's not transferred directly like that. Um, Luckily, the rabies virus is not stable outside of the body. So it's not the ideal situation and it's kind of for any kind of situation, you don't really want to get any animal saliva into your eyes, nose, mouth, or a wound. Um, for other purposes of bacteria, sorry, and other types of viruses that are out there, um, but that is not how rabies would be trans transmitted. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that we have is regarding to uh, the case of the child in Florida who died. So according to the article, it said that an experimental but flawed treatment, what does that mean? I believe there is, so with people that kind of show up to the doctor or the hospital with rabies, um, they will always try to institute some form of treatment, um, but because it is a virus that has no actual cure, you cannot cure a virus. Um, they probably tried um, vaccines as well as the regular treatment, um, just a really aggressive form of trying to trigger the body into making antibodies against the virus to help combat the virus within the system. Um, but of course, the as we said, once you have symptoms, they're just, it is very likely that you will pass away. And so it's not necessarily flawed, but more so once you have symptoms and the virus is already in your brains, or sorry, in your brain or in your nerves, um, no matter how many rabies vaccines or no matter how many rabies antibodies you put into your system, um, it's probably just too late. Okay, so with that said, how long does it take for symptoms to show themselves? Oh, sorry, could you repeat that one more time? Um, so how long does it take for symptoms to present themselves? 
Right, so symptoms could take after you get bit by an animal with rabies. Symptoms could appear anytime from maybe weeks after the bite all the way up to years after the bite. Um, the typical length of time is maybe um, two to three months, but, but it does have a really long, what we call incubation period, meaning that maybe it's a couple weeks or maybe it could be even years after a bite um, when you start to show symptoms. Okay, um, is there a rabies vaccine for humans? There is a rabies vaccine for humans. Um, so if you are, say you are someone that has a job where you work directly with wildlife or animals or have a lot of exposure to biting animals. Um, so say for myself, being a veterinarian, I am slightly more exposed than somebody else um, to animals that potentially want to bite me or wildlife that could have rabies. And so I myself have gotten pre-exposure rabies vaccinations. And so there are rabies vaccines for humans. Do you ever, do you think there will ever be a titter to test for rabies immunity in companion animals? Um, so I think what they're asking for is a rabies titer. Um, so a rabies titer test actually does exist. Um, I believe it's run through, it's run through several different labs. I know of one that's run through Kansas State um, Laboratory. Um, you can test to see how much or the level of antibodies in your pet system um, that there is to rabies, but it is not a What's tricky about it is that there is no published data that says a level of arbitrarily, just throwing it out there, a level of five is protective if your pet gets bitten by a rabid bat. Or just another number, just saying a level of two is protective. There is no published data that says this is the protective level of antibodies within a dog or a cat or pet system. Okay, and then I have one last question here. Um, oh, well, I've got a couple more. Scratch that. Um, in your opinion, do you feel the three years rabies vaccine is just as effective as the one year for animals? Yes, it is completely. Um, I vaccinate my pets with the three year rabies vaccine and having worked in the shelters and as a private practice veterinarian, Yes, it is just as effective. Okay. Um, would you recommend that dog trainers who work with puppies get a rabies vaccine? That's a great question. I feel like if you think you have a lot of exposure to unvaccinated pets, um, or if you feel like you truly are getting bit a lot, um, that is something to talk to your doctor about and talk to them about, hey, I feel like this could be a rabies exposure. And then you would work with your doctor um, to get those vaccinations, pre-exposure vaccinations. Okay, that's all the questions that we have um, from our audience. Okay. Um, do you have anything else to add, Dr. J? No, except thank you so much for this opportunity. All right. And before we sign off, I've got another poll question for the audience. We would like to know here at Pasadena Humane how the community hears about this webinar. So if you would take a moment to just answer the question that's up on your screen. We would appreciate that very much.
All right, and Dr. J, I want to thank you for taking the time to spend with us today and giving us you know, some great tips and a plethora of education on rabies. I've learned quite a few things today myself. No problem. Thank you so much. And I encourage anybody to contact us at the, the contact information shown if you have any questions. All right. And with that, we are going to sign out and I, we do hope that you will join us next time when we go over dog massage. Bye, Dr. J. Bye.